Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited because I haven't seen so many people in any room for a long, long time. Um, so I guess the excitement overrides the fear. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful. Um, my name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone and introduce today's panel on race, racism, and Palestine. And the panel is organized by Professor Nora Erakat, who is our uh, visiting fellow in Palestinian studies. Nora is the third uh, this year. We first had Rima Hamami from Brazil University and then Ruba Saleh from SOAS. And uh, all of them are linked to the Mahmoud Davish chair in Palestinian studies. Um, I'm going to introduce Nora. And uh, Nora has organized this panel today, and I will also introduce the panelists. So Nora Erakat is an associate professor of Africana Studies and in the program in criminal justice at Rutgers University and non-resident fellow of the Religious Literacy Project at Harvard Divinity School. Her research includes human rights law, laws of armed conflict, national security law, as well as critical race theory. Nora is the author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, which was, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2019, which received the Palestine Book Award and the Bronze Medal for the Independent Publishers Book Award in Current of Events, Foreign Affairs. She is co-founding editor of Jadalia and editorial board member of the Journal of Palestine Studies. She has served as legal counsel for a congressional subcommittee in the US House of Representatives, as legal advocate for the Badil Resource Center for Palestinian Refugee and Residency Rights, and as national organizer of the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Noura has also produced video documentaries, including Gaza in Context and Black Palestinian Solidarity. So welcome, Noura. <laughs> um, And Nora is also giving a talk, um, a lecture on Thursday at 4 o'clock, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, the second, uh, so on the panel, we have Professor Shireen Saikali. Uh, Shireen is an associate professor of history at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is the author of Men of Capital, Scarcity, and Economy in Mandat Palestine. Will we actually see them up? Oh, that would be, can we get to see them? Yay. Yay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, Shireen, can you wave? Yay, okay. So, um, Shireen is the author of Men of Capital, Scarcity, and Economy in Mandate Palestine, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2016. She is following the trajectory of her great-grandfather in her forthcoming book titled From Baltimore to Beirut, on the question of Palestine. His trajectory from 19th century mobility across Baltimore and Sudan to 20th century immobility in Lebanon places the question of Palestine in a global history of race, capital, slavery, and dispossession. She is a co-editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies, senior editor of the Arab Studies Journal, and co-editor of Jadalia. Welcome, Shireen. Lana Latour, sorry, Lana Tatour. Lana Tattoo is an assistant professor in global development at the School of Social Science, University of New South Wales, Australia. She was the 2019-2020 Ibrahim Abulogud postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University. She is currently completing a book provisionally titled Ambivalent Resistance, Palestinians in Israel, and the liberal politics of settler colonialism and human rights. She is also co-editing together with Ronit Lentin a book provisionally titled Race and the Question of Palestine. John Reynolds is an associate professor at the School of Law and Criminology, Maynolds University, Ireland. His teaching, research, and writing focus on questions of international law and global justice in relation to colonialism, emergency, race, and political economy. 
John is the author of Empire, Emergency, and International Law, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, and an editor of the Third World Approaches to International Law Review. And finally, on the panel, but not least, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, who is Steve Charles Professor of Media, Cities, and Solutions at Temple University. Prior to that, he held positions at Columbia University and Morehouse College. He is currently the host of BET News and the Coffee and Books podcast. An award-winning journalist, Dr. Hill has received numerous prestigious awards from the National Association of Black Journalists, GLAD, and the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences. Professor Hill is the author or co-author of seven books, amongst them the award-winning Beats, Rhymes, and Classroom Life, Hip Hop, Pedagogy, and the Politics of Identity, The Classroom and the Cell, Conversations on Black Life in America. Please help me in welcoming everyone. <laughs> so over to you, Nora. Okay. Hello, hello, and thank you. Thank you especially to these amazing scholars, teachers, friends, whom I wish we could be in the room together right now, and unfortunately, we have to settle for this. But the photos will tell a different story. Um, we also all happen to be in uh, Lana's co-edited volume, so this is also an honor to bring it together. Um, it's especially an honor to be here before you as the Mahmoud Darwish Fellow in Palestinian Studies here at Brown. Thank you to Professors Nadir Ali, to Alex uh, Wider, to Shara Dumani, and especially to Barbara Ober Oberkater for um, making it possible for me to be here. Uh, the fellowship is especially an honor because I share it with uh, Professors Rima Hamami and Roba Saleh, scholars I have long admired, and with whom I hope I am continuing the legacy of engaged scholarship. This engagement has reflected an ongoing conversation between movement and the academy. This panel is one such engagement with race, racism, and Palestine that has been informed by events within the last decade. This is not to discount the rich scholarship on race and racism advanced by Palestinian thinkers, including Edward Said, Fayez Sayer, Nadira Shalhoub Kavorkian, Leila Abu Lughd, Hassan Saab, and Ra'if Zrik, among many others. The purpose of thinking about the last decade in particular is to think about a recent history of the intellectual present. And in many ways, this accounting maps my own intellectual itinerary as I have run down many, many rabbit holes of my own making. I suggest there have been three key moments that have shaped the current landscape of scholarship on race, racism, and Palestine in the last decade alone, the 2014 Gaza-Ferguson moment, the 2020 Black uprisings, and the 2021 Palestinian Unity Intifada. These are moments when movements have produced questions that activists have deliberated in struggle and which scholars have attempted to answer in their production of knowledge. Chapter one. This recent history begins in the summer 2014 during the simultaneous bombardment of Gaza and the occupation of Ferguson, also known as the Gaza-Ferguson moment, which catalyzed renewals of black Palestinian transnational solidarity and an analytical return to an understanding of colonialism and racism as co-constitutive structures of domination. During the apex of these renewals in November 2014, Professor Frank Wilderson III made a comment in an interview that dashed the romanticism encasing black Palestinian solidarity Wilderson explained, so right now, pro-Palestinian people are saying Ferguson is an example of what's happening in Palestine, and you all are getting what we're getting. That's just bullshit. Is that cool? Okay, bullshit. First, there's no time period in which black police and slave domination have ever ended. Second, the Arabs and the Jews are as much a part of the black slave trade, the creation of blackness as social death as anyone else. As I told a friend of mine, yeah, we're going to help you get rid of Israel, but the moment that you set up your shit, we're going to be right there to jack you up because anti-blackness is as important and necessary to the formation of Arab psychic life as it is to the formation of Jewish psychic life. I remember when I came across this quote in 2014, it didn't make sense to me. Were our, were our allies asking us to be perfect victims? Was this solidarity conditional? 
Isn't our adversary the same? Having developed a political analysis in the crucible of student and community activism, it was a political analysis and not identity politics that sutured our joint struggles. Was that being torn apart here? The beginning of the study for me was an introduction to Afro-pessimism as an analytical framework that according to Wilson and others, depends on a regime of anti-black violence that creates a structural antagonism between human and black. One that defines the human in opposition to a black lack of humanity. Professor Sara Ahmoud was among my first teachers on the subject and she most plainly explained it to me as a radical return to Frantz Fanon, particularly in black skin, white masks, to understand anti-blackness as an ontological point of departure. And what Professor Chris Hint Tinson summed up was a critique without a resolution. It is the end. In my own search for answers, I found what seemed like a raging debate that attempted to resolve the relationship between indigeneity and blackness, between settler colonialism and slavery as competing points of departure that have indel indelibly shaped our present. In his intervention, The Veil of Slavery, Jared Sexton urged for settler decolonization without sovereignty or the restoration of indigenous sovereignty because that assumes that the tragedy of enslavement is the loss of a relationship to land. But Sexton argues that the tragic loss is the connection to the self. Therefore, decolonization must begin in the flesh and not on the land. In contrast, other scholars have, tr have tried to find more resonance between these two paradigms, arguing that indigeneity and anti-blackness not only coexist, but are mutually constitutive of one another. For example, Tiffany Lesotho King attempts to resolve it in her work, Black Shoals, a geological formation that in fact embodies her primary analytical point, that somewhere between land and water is the shoal, which is sedimented rock submerged just beneath water, neither on land completely, neither in the water completely. On the ground, we find the entwinements of blackness and an indigeneity, the, necess the necessity of both genocide and slavery, not as distinct phenomena, but as reinforcing ones. In being or nothingness, Eco Day rejects reducing blackness to enslaved labor or indigeneity to genocide. Instead, Day argues settler colonialism abides by a dual logic that is originally driven to eliminate native peoples from the land and mix the land with enslaved black labor. This admixture is inextricable, thus negating a definitive origin. Just as Justin Leroy takes us to Palestine to resolve this. There he finds the radical black tradition and indigenous resurgence suffuse in Palestinian land, which, despite its distance from the United States, in fact bridges the gap between anti-blackness and settler colonialism. Empire, he argues, has functioned by making its victims both Indian and black. Many scholars took issue with Afro-pessimism altogether as a dangerous trend. In Afro-Blue Notes, Greg Thomas heaves a searing critique at the School of Thought, taking it to task for its strictly Engli English archive and US-centric concern that creates a myopia of sorts. He's concerned that to think of the afterlife of slavery as beginning in 1865 is to reinscribe the most imperial white American perspective on slavery and blackness instead. Thomas highlights how Wilderson's contrast of Palestine and blackness, for example, erases Afro-Palestinians, discounts the significance of Palestine to an African geography and a political imagination at the height of Afro-Asian solidarity, to say nothing of the iconoclastic status of Fatima Bernawi in Palestinian nationalism and third world revolt more generally. The debate forced another question into focus. Are racism and anti-blackness the same thing? In chasing this question, I came upon racial capitalism, which urges us to examine historical specificities, to ask who is racialized, and why in this moment, and how, and according to what logic. Cedric Robinson, the historian credited for the concept, highlights that racism was not simply a convention for ordering relations between Europeans and non-European peoples, but has its genesis in the internal relations of European peoples themselves. And so he begins his study in feudal England to demonstrate that the inferior other is not always a darker other. Robinson demonstrates that racism did not precede modernity and thus cannot be transhistorically or geographically defined. 
but anti-blackness is distinct and seems to have both features. How then can we understand these phenomena in tension? Chapter two. The 2020 black uprisings provided an opportunity to answer this question. The confluence of the disproportionate impact of COVID that revealed race as a comorbidity, together with ongoing spectacles of grotesque violence, including the killings of Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and most notoriously, George Floyd, catalyzed what became one of the largest social movements in the United States in the last century. Unlike the 2014 occupation of Ferguson in the summer 2020, Palestinians were not si simultaneously engaged in mass uprising. In fact, there emerged an interesting phenomena amongst Palestinians and Arab Americans more generally, as some called for highlighting similarities of state violence in Palestine and lifting up the banner of black Palestinian solidarity, while others within the community pushed back and urged that ethical solidarity required squarely centering black uprising in this moment and that doing otherwise would be shallow, if not opportunistic. The commitment to ethical solidarity catalyzed the scrutiny of anti-blackness in all aspects of study, as well as communal life. This pivot was certainly not unique amongst Middle East um, scholars or peoples, as the concern with structural violence caused a collective moment of pause and reckoning across a significant number of public and private institutions. Among Middle East study scholars, this manifested in a flurry of panels excavating histories of, enslave, of enslavement in the Islamic and Arab worlds. Platforms featuring Afro-Arabs um, Arabs narrating personal stories in Arabic tongues, as well as panels that strictly lifted up African and African descendant produced scholarship. In June 2020, the Middle East Studies Association issued a statement that pr the product of many hours of study as struggle and declared that solidarity is not enough and pledged to oppose anti-black racist violence by addressing structural injustice in the organization, in the field, and among our communities. The statement continued by lifting up the name of Faustina Tay, a Ghanaian domestic worker in Lebanon subject to abuse by her employers and left to die in a parking lot. The statement recognizes the racism against indentured labor in the MENA region as a core component of anti-blackness and the struggle against it. Eve Trout Powell, Mesa's current president, has done foundational work in this regard as she examined the history of African slavery in the Nile Valley, as well as Egypt, Sudan, and across the Ottoman Empire more generally. In his work, Captive Passages, Daryl Lee builds on his erudite reading of universalism and solidarity among Muslim transnational fighters to tell us another story of being black and Muslim in Guantanamo Bay. Using the memoirs of Muhammad Oud Salahi of Mauritania and Walid Muhammad Al Hajj of Sudan, Lee demonstrates the racialization of Islam and blackness together and separately, using the analytic of captivity as preceding enslavement, similar to the analytic of flesh as preceding the body. Muriam Hali Davis, whose forthcoming book, Markets of Civilization, will provide a history of racial capitalism in Algeria, has similarly been keen to study how race and religion, and specifically blackness and Islam, should be studied relationally, and how the porousness between these categories continues to inform sectarianism across the Middle East. Samir Razoui highlights Morocco's breach of a tradition never to enslave other Muslims when the Moroccan king of the Saudi dynasty conquers Muslims in the West African Songhai in 1591 and enslaves them precisely because they are black. Razoui goes on to explore whether this moment laid the foundation for centuries of anti-black racism that has followed across North Africa. On this panel, Professor Shirin Say Ali and Mark Lamont Hill are currently adding to this archive in their exciting and illuminating work. Professor Say Ali is examining the place of Palestinians in the Sudan under British Empire, appearing simultaneously as equal colonial subjects as well as dominant non-black Arabs. For several years now and counting, Professor Hill has been conducting anthropological fieldwork with Palestinians of African descent in Jerusalem, Tulkarem, Jericho, and beyond, where they have made sense of themselves as a colonized and racialized community, as Palestinian and black, and most often as Afro-Palestinians. Chapter three. This brings us to the present political moment and the last juncture in the three I have identified. Today, when the memory and the pain of the 2021 Unity Intifada still rings off our skin, when young Palestinians kidnapped from their parents, including and especially Palestinian citizens of Israel, are still in captivity and without fair trial,
when the dead have not been properly mourned, and some of them are still held hostage in freezers. In this context, Israeli state officers assail worshipers, children, beat fathers, rain fire on two million besieged Palestinians in Gaza to remind us once again that the natives have no God. There is nothing sacred to revere. There is only cumbersome, inconvenient, annoying flesh. The unity in Tifada, so significant in scope and breadth that it invoked comparisons to the 1936 to the 1939 Great Revolt, ushered a sea change on at least three distinct registers. For the world, it reminded them that Palestinians are not a metaphor or a slogan, but a site of a dizzying thirst for life. For the first time, US audiences began to understand the Palestinian cause as a freedom struggle and understood the oppressive weight of what aboutism and a false parity between nuclear power and stateless people. And for Palestinians, it was transcendence above and over violent juridical and geographic demarcations to say in, union, in unison and with clarity, in these days, we write a new chapter, a chapter of a united intifada that seeks our one and only goal, reuniting Palestinian society in all of its different parts, reuniting our political will and our means of struggle to confront Zionism throughout Palestine. This era has catalyzed its own reckoning. Finally, mainstream and Israeli human rights organizations recognized the legal regime separating populations and subjecting them to distinct treatment for the sake, for the sake of maintaining Jewish supremacy as apartheid. But while these organizations were finally catching up, Palestinians themselves abandoned the legalese and embarked on an analytical return that has brought us face to face once again with Zionism, with the ideology, as well as the political movement, to the ends of status solution, to the demand of decolonization, to the frustration with analogies to apartheid. Zionism is not like apartheid. It is its intellectual and political analog. It merits scrutiny on its own terms, not simply in comparisons. Here is the ground where our scholars constituting the Palestinian radical tradition and our contemporary scholars engaged in this study are meeting and building anew. Uh, my presentation on Thursday afternoon will engage with this directly and head on. And tonight, Professors Lana Tatur and John Reynolds will share with us their rich works on the limits of liberal equality, the machinations of repressive inclusion, and the palpable reach of decolonization. I have spent endless hours in discussion, discussion with each of these panelists um, in long walks, over text threads, phone calls, meals, and of course, WhatsApp voice memos. <laughs> What's a vexing and nerdy inquiry without a series of horribly long voice memos? So, and thank you for enduring me, all of you. <laughs> so it is both perfectly fitting and incredibly exciting today that Shireen, Lana, John, and Mark are in conversation with one another, with me, and with all of us. I have posed a question to each of them based on our nerdy conversations. I'm very excited as they share with us their um, responses. And with that, I turn the mic to you, dear Shireen. Thank you so much um, for that incredible invitation to think and act. And I am really honored to be in this wonderful group of thinkers, uh, organizers, and artists who have inspired me to continue the work. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have five images to share with you today. Everybody can see those? Okay. What is the relationship between race and sovereignty? How does anti-Blackness travel across time and space? What lessons does Palestine offer on these questions? I will share today with you five photographs from my family papers that are informing and inspiring my current journey through these questions. Let me start with a few words on the main characters that we will follow in these images. Naim and Anise Kotran. 
Naim Kutran, who was born in 1877, circa, and passed in 1961, was born in the northern coastal city of Acre, Palestine, at that time under Ottoman rule. He began his education at the Syrian Protestant College in Beirut, and in 1899, he traveled to Baltimore to continue his medical training at the University of Maryland. Naim returned to Palestine to become one of Acre's first registered medical doctors. During World War I, he served as a medical official in Omdurman, Sudan, with the Anglo-Egyptian army. On his return to Palestine, then under British rule, he married Anise Saikali, was born in 1896 and passed in 1978. At that time, Anis's parents gifted Naim an enslaved woman named Sada. Naim and his young wife, Anisi, manumitted Sada. She lived and died with them as their domestic servant. Eight miles northeast of Acre, in a village called Nahr al-Naba, Naim and Anisi owned about 20 hectares of land. During the War of 1948, their children and grandchildren took refuge in Lebanon and Egypt. Naim and Anisi stayed on the land in an attempt to hold on to Palestine's shrinking remains. They lost that battle in 1951 and became refugees who lived the last years of their lives in Lebanon. Naim and Anisi were my great grandparents. Oops. So this is our second image for today. And it's a photograph of my great grandparents in 1949, one year after the fateful twin birth of the Israeli state and the ongoing Palestinian condition, the inception of our ongoing Nakba. They stand here broken on the grounds of their burnt orchards, Orchards, my great-grandfather petitioned time and again, were, quote, my private property, end of quote. Naim and Anisi would die in exile, impoverished and defeated. If I were to begin my story with this moment and work backwards, I would only study British and Zionist movements, enterprises, and power. But 1948 was only one moment of my great-grandparents' journey. And I really believe that, um, you know, and I've learned this from Rana Barakat, that our ancestors don't haunt us, they guide us. And that's why I have them next to me all the time with all their limits and, and flaws. And I really believe that, that to understand their lessons, I have to ask about the different subjectivities that, that they inhabited. And this other longer story is richer it's more troubling and it's more instructive in many ways. And it demands that I resist the colonial and nationalist logics that have defined my thinking and have for a long time also defined the Palestinian struggle. Although I think the unity uprising and many uprisings before have actually really worked to challenge um, some of those logics. And perhaps we can talk more about that in the discussion. So I just wanna give you some glimpses of that story today. Okay. In this, the third image, we see Sada. She's standing behind my great grandfather, carrying uh, one of his children. This is a child who would pass. Um, the, the, the young girl on, in the corner is my grandmother, Eileen. Um, and I, and I want to just think a little bit with you about Sada and who she was and what she might have to teach us. Sada was likely Ethiopian or possibly Eritrean. Her life was disrupted by slavery consistent with the well-documented markets for human trafficking in the Eastern Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula that Nura um, gestured to in her wonderful introduction. And we know that since at least the ninth century, when a series of East African rebellions shook Basra in Iraq and to the present, the slave trade in this part of the world has flourished 
often drawing from markets in Sudan and Ethiopia to staff armies and households. In 19th century Egypt, Arab, Nubian, and Turkish enslavers regarded Ethiopians or Habash as superior to other East Africans. So I think this is another thing to really sit with, right? The hierarchies um, um, within multiple forms of racialization. And of those enslaved captives who were sold and trafficked to Egypt, Ethiopian women were ranked aesthetically between white Circassian and East African. African women, and this kind of reflects the sexual vulnerability of women abducted into slavery during village raids. The traces of Saga's life remind us that slavery is a 20th century story, and that both the slave trade and slaveholding in Palestine were active under Ottoman rule. While the British government would officially end slavery, and this is a really important history to think about in terms of Sudan and also Morocco and North Africa, the way that British abolitionism actually increased enslavement, even if it attempted to constrain the actual trade. And I think those complexities are really important to study with uh, 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 and, um, you know, historicize. Um, but demand for slavery would continue after 1917. And, and as far as we know, there was no document effort to end the trade earlier. Um, most of what we know about the history of slavery in Palestine is limited to the Nakab, where Bedouins enslaved Africans. And today, the descendants of those enslaved people identify Sudan and Ethiopia as their ancestral homelands. Sada lived in my ancestor's urban household, which is an important divergence. Her experience of manumission, though marked by the family, uh, did not really result in a substantively different life for Sada. And she continued to work in the home and died there, suggesting that her duties remain the same until her final days. Referring to her as part of the family, is a really important kind of technology here. And this is something that people like Ahmed Sikainga, Eve Trout Powell, Shuil Hamid, a lot of people work on slavery, particularly in North Africa, attune us to, which is that the terms of kinship, which actually enslavement and slavery break kinship, right, are a technology of erasing um, that violence and captivity. And so often, you know, in, in family narratives, people would talk about Saga as well. She was part of the family, part of the family, which is actually itself a kind of technology of erasure. And one of the things that's interesting about the next image, so here you see this image, in this image, you see Sada, right? And she's standing right behind my great grandfather with his um, mustache. And in this image, although it's very difficult to make out, this is the same in image you see my great grandmother. Um, but in this image, uh, Sada is kind of cut out of the family um, photograph. And I find this to be really a, a kind of interesting set of evidence about the boundaries of family and kinship and this kind of excision um, to make room for the quote unquote true family. Uh, and even though these are still very meager traces that I'm hoping in the, in the, in the months to come with um, with a, a leave that I'm excited to take that I'll be able to um, uh, search out more of these traces. I still think they tell us a lot. They tell us about a Palestinian Christian family um, that enslaved and, and marginally manumitted uh, 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 an Ethiopian or Eritrean woman. And I think here in a, one of the really important story, um, stories that this invites us to think about is that histories of slavery in Arabia and the Eastern Mediterranean have really focused on Islam in particular and its relationship to captivity and bondage. But here Sada bears witness to a Palestinian Christian story. And this story, since I've begun tracing her trajectory, I've learned, was by no means exceptional. So let me turn to my last um, photograph image for today. And this is 
um, most likely taken in 1916. And if you look closely, you see my great grandfather um, sitting cross legged and authoritative and donning the signature pith helmet of, of the British imperial official. And the pith helmet is a really important symbol of understandings of the tropics themselves, understandings of climate that are very linked to how people understand race, racialization, and civilization. And you see two Black Sudanese men stand at his side. One is wearing a turban, the other is wearing a a tarbush. And here you, you know, you kind of have to look at this young man and his elaborate mustache and his colonial affect and, and wonder that how he could never have imagined that the very British officials he was emulating would be the source of his own dispossession. Here, I think it's important to take note that it wasn't simply the British or later the Israelis who held tightly to civilizational logics. Naim too believed himself to be culturally and racially superior. And that logic would eventually shatter in the wake of dispossession. I think our work um, in these urgent times is to understand how did it take shape initially and what it can teach us. Naim likely arrived to Sudan around 1911, and he practiced medicine in the Omdurman civil hospital where this image was taken. At this time, the Anglo-Egyptian condominium, which basically inaugurated the British colonization of Sudan, had been established about a dozen years earlier in 1899. And the Sudan Medical Service was a crucial arm of the colonial enterprise. You know, this was the way that they mapped new and ruled Sudan. Um, As in many other contexts, medicalization and colonization really worked hand in hand to forge knowledge and power. And this is a field rife with competition and it sort of uh, reveals how power, science, care, and race are all kind of informing each other. And there are multiple institutions in competition, including military hospitals, civil hospitals, uh, the Wellcome Tropical Research Laboratories. So for people who know about Wellcome, he was a uh, pharmaceutical, he was actually a U.S. pharmaceutical um, corporate a uh, 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 figure who was very invested in white supremacy and very linked also to Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Um, and he establishes this laboratory in Khartoum as a kind of um, initial frontier to, to access um, multiple markets. And even though there was a lot of competition and resentment between all of these various colonial and corporate institutions, there was a clear consensus on policing and medicalizing Sudan as a racial state. And just like the governors and clerks who ran this um, Anglo-Egyptian condominium, the the governing structure, the doctors like my great grandfather were also engaged in constituting, maintaining and managing whiteness to forge a state in which white rule prevailed. So what what is Naim doing here? And and what what do we understand from his role and experience? It's interesting because Naim, who would have identified at this time as a Palestinian from greater Syria, um, wasn't an anomaly. In fact, the British colonial government are recruiting uh, 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 Syrian Christians in particular who are training um, at the Syrian Protestant College and multiple other universities. And this is because Um, Lord Cromer, who rules Egypt and Sudan from 1883 to 1907, like many other British colonial officials, really understand Syrian Christians, greater, so here I mean greater Syria, right, um, as morally, socially, and intellectually superior to their Muslim brethren. And they're they're very concerned by Egyptian calls for self-determination that are increasing at this time. And they understand people like Naeem as anti-national, passive, apolitical, and white, or at least white adjacent. 
And in the minds of these men, um, these British overlords, it is much easier to depend on these um, Syrian Christians to be at the front lines of coercive and militarized attempts to control and sometimes introduce various diseases um, in Sudan. So one of the things that's really interesting, and I know I've taken up too much time, I'm about, to, I'm about two more minutes and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm finishing. One of the things that's really interesting about this story is that for men like Naim, the Anglo-Egyptian government is a really a source of social mobility and capital. Um, but at the same time, it is also a place of a kind of rapid realization that they're more like objects than subjects of empire. And here Sudan becomes a very interesting place to shape a new self for men like Naim, who are kind of shifting from confessionalism or sectarianism and a kind of committed Anglophilia to the beginnings of, it, of an anti-imperial subjectivity that would kind of culminate in Arab nationalism. So the idea here that's so interesting is that these men understand themselves as uh, distinct from blackness and black Sudanese, but also they come to understand that they were, that they aren't like the British and that they are colonized in ways that parallel the people they believe they are superior to. And so the interesting dynamic here is to think about one, how sectarianism and race are overlapping and informing each other or confessionalism and race. And two, what is this experience of people at least thinking of themselves as both white and colonized? And this is, Sudan is particularly interesting too because it isn't a settler colony and it gives us a, a different kind of set of um, experiences. So I'm just gonna conclude with some quick thoughts here. Um, some may suggest and some have that by telling this story, I'm feeding the forces who seek to deny my personhood or the forces who are um, brutally continuing to go after Palestinians in their places of worship, on their lands um, as they continue to hold ground in Palestine. I don't believe that the people who deny me my personhood should determine the questions I ask. And I think that resi resisting that impulse of evidencing humanity and worthiness and asking the hard questions is how I can begin to take part in imagining different futures. And I think part of this task is really to study and take seriously anti-Blackness, race, Arabness. What are these categories, right? They're not simply or only a product of European colonialism. They are not essential or self-evident um, characteristics. Um, these are contingent and dynamic historical processes that if we take them seriously, we can move beyond a historical understandings of the Arab black binary and the Arab as always already anti-black. The current moment, um, as Nuda has so powerfully invited us to think about, has really enlarged um, the scope of Black Palestine solidarity to refuse that binary um, that disappears Black people from Palestine or more broadly broadly from Arabness. And Sudan, I think, is a particularly rich site in this regard that challenges these binaries and allows us to see overlapping geographies of land, people, and experience. And I think, um, uh, as Nora really so powerfully put it, um, you know, there's a growing tide of work and there's a, a really wonderful archive of people who've been doing this work and centering and recentering race as an analytical lens. I think one of the things for us in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Arabian Peninsula and North Africa, you know, we have to stop seeing the Atlantic slave trade as both an alibi <laughs> for not doing this very difficult work in our own own, um, parts of the world. And I think that doing that work is one way uh, to escape the confines of also understanding uh, movement work, Black Palestine solidarity, for example, or back Black Palestine struggle, which I think is more effective than thinking about it as solidarity. Um, I think we if we do this work, we can move beyond thinking of Black Palestine struggle as commensurable or symmetrical. Uh, I don't think we need to think about them as 
you know, symmetrical, I think that the resonance between them is because they have informed one another historically and in the present. They have created the, the very categories that we use today. And I think if we decenter in particular, the question of Europe and our location in and to it, we can begin to see these very productive discomforts of our past and our present. And perhaps confronting those discomforts is one way to better imagine freedom in the future. Thank you. Lana? Thank you. Um, Shireen's work always uh, inspires me and I'm uh, uh, really honored to be part of this panel and being uh, in conversation um, with so many wonderful scholars who are doing really uh, uh, important work on Palestine and on race. And Nora, thank you for uh, bringing us together. Um, I wanna start uh, by acknowledging that I'm joining from uh, Gadigal land, known as Sydney, Australia. It is on this land where some of my thinking around the possibilities and limitations of the frameworks of indigeneity and citizenship, and recently also apartheid, and the relationship between settler colonialism, race, and liberalism has evolved and continue to evolve. Being between Gadigal land and Palestine has also taught me of the risks of using these frameworks without building on Palestinian intellectual legacy and present work, and without accounting to the multiplicity of Palestinian experiences and also as Shireen has highlighted, our location, right, between Europe, the Middle East, um, and our history as a global uh, uh, history. I started to think about the politics of citizenship and indigeneity back in 2011, when I started my PhD on 48 Palestinians, uh, who are also known as Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I was struck by the absence of race. And back then, it was also the absence of settler colonialism in thinking about 48 Palestinians. The absence struck me precisely because I was reading Palestinian scholarship, including, including uh, uh, Edward Said, Ibrahim Abu Lughod, Nadia Abu Hajj, uh, Joseph Massad, and others, whose understanding of the question of, of Palestine is grounded in settler colonial and, races, and race analysis. Similarly, the early work on 48 Palestinians by Palestinian scholars, and particularly Elias Re's work, has been guided by recognition of the relevance of settler colonialism and race and the entwinement of the two. After all, all this body of scholarship reminds us that there is no settler colonialism without racialization and that settler colonialism is always imbued in politics of race. Yet in the 1980s and in the 90s onwards, ethnicity and ethno-nationalism became the dominant frameworks, especially in the study of 48 Palestinians, but not only. The focus on ethnicity obscured race as an analytic. Even later studies on settler colonialism often retain the commitment to ethnocracy and ethno-nationalism as explanatory frameworks. Israel was conceptualized as an ethnic, ethno-national, and ethnocratic state with a focus on ethnic privilege and ethno-national difference. Ethnicity came to function as a category that is race-free and raceless a non-racial category of difference. As Alana Lenten puts it and has taught me what we had is thinking about issues, and I'm quoting, that are race without talking about race. 
which resulted in eradicating, quoting again, the hierarchical implication of superiority and inferiority that are built into the idea of race, end of quote. And so I became interested in what is on stake politically and analytically when we replace race with ethnicity and its associated concept culture. Often they go together. I began to think through how our analysis and understanding of citizenship and indigeneity, and recently, again, also apartheid, can change if we recenter race and settler colonialism as intertwined. And if we examine them in relation to the tension between liberal politics of equality, minority rights, cultural rights, and recognition, and anti-colonial liberationist politics that centers decolonization and the dismantling of settler colonialism and the racial structures that enable it and sustain it. Citizenship has been the dominant framework in looking at uh, 48 Palestinian stat status. It was also the dominant and to an extent remained though it is being challenged significantly um, in the past decade, also remains central in, the political, uh, in their political struggle uh, uh, against Israel. Recently, citizenship is also being raised as, potential, as a potential emancipatory path to Palestinians, all Palestinians between the river and the sea, and in some extent also to Palestinian refugees. The focus on apartheid, the apartheid framework by international organizations such as Amnesty and Human Rights Watch is furthering this agenda especially given that these organizations have been focusing on racial discrimination and domination and liberal question of equality as delinked from settler colonialism, from race, from Zionism as racial ideology, as Noura and John's interventions uh, have clearly shown. The focus on citizenship draws on a liberal commitment to the idea that the extension of citizenship to all Palestinians can remedy discrimination, domination, exclusion, and denial of rights. However, looking at the experience of 48 Palestinians for over, over seven decades show that the liberal promise of citizenship is illusionary. The promise of inclusion that could never be fulfilled under settler colonialism works to tame Palestinian struggle within a liberal grammar. To try and trouble the normative attachment to citizenship, I went back to the Israeli archives to trace the making of Israel's citizenship regime, and specifically the law of return and citizenship law that were adopted in 1950 and 1952, respectively. Protocols of cabinet meetings, Knesset sessions, and legislative committees revealed how citizenship in Israel has figured as an institution of domination, a mechanism uh, of racial elimination, and an instrument of race making. Citizenship did not merely reflect an ethno-national difference as often claimed. In effect, citizenship operated as a race making institution designed to advance what Faisai have called racial elimination of Palestinians and produced racial subjects and racial hierarchies between Jews and Palestinians. Jews were and still are perceived as natural subjects of citizenship, were entitled to a God-given semi-birthright citizenship, and they're seen proper to the land. In co contrast, and we know that, the vast majority of Palestinians are locked out of citizenship and thus of the right to return. The few who were granted citizenship were seen as inferior subjects, whose citizenship is not a natural entitlement, but a product of the benevolence of the Israeli state. The implications of thinking of citizenship as a structure of domination and as a race-making institution is that decolonization and deracialization cannot be achieved through the struggle for citizenship or the decolonization, decolonization of citizenship, but rather through its transcendence. This brought me to consider 
whether indigeneity could operate as a radical alternative, a radical alternative to liberal citizenship and to masculine nationalism as well. In many ways, indigeneity allowed 48 Palestinians to claim rights, not merely as citizens, but as indigenous subjects. One of the more successful claim has been by the Bedouin um, uh, community in the Naqab, who are recognized as indigenous by the UN and other international agencies and organizations. But looking at scholarship and advocacy around Bedouin claim to indigeneity, it became evident that indigeneity has been reconfigured from a political category rooted in the experience of settler colonialism and as an oppositional category to settlers to a cultural essentialist and rationalizing category that is premised on the fetishization of the Bedouin as a pre-modern and endangered culture that ought to be preserved and protected. The discourse on Bedouin indigeneity followed the broader process of culturalization of indigeneity. By that, I mean the mechanisms by which culture has become the basis for recognizing indigenous people and their rights to land and the entwinement of indigenous rights with racial and colonial productions of liberal multiculturalism. Accordingly, racial logics have been coded into indigeneity through the grammar of culture. Through the use of culture, indigeneity has been constructed as a signifier for racial civilizational difference, and as a clash between traditional cultures and the modern nation state. And traditional is often a code word for pre-modernity. And this has been a discourse that have been really reiterated in critical scholarship as well in very troubling ways. So the political implications of the culturalization of indigeneity are significant. Bedouin are, in, are recognized that it's indigenous not because they belong to the Palestinian people or they because they face settler colonialism but actually because their identity as Palestinians could be made absent from the conversation on indigeneity. And this is really significant. And it's also because Bedouin, because the Bedouin can be culturally and racially differentiated from other Palestinians. And here it's really also important to uh, uh, recognize uh, the legacy of looking, of seeing uh, 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 the Bedouin as a distinctive race, which goes back to, the, to British legacies as the work of Siraj Asi uh, shows. So I'll conclude by, um, by saying that at the level of scholarship and activist mobilization, we do see a return to a growing use of critical concepts and frameworks. Settler colonialism, race, indigeneity, apartheid, and decolonization are some of these kind of frameworks and concepts that keep repeating, that keep reiterating in new, recent scholarship. But there's also a deep contestation over the interpretation of these concepts and frameworks and what they mean and what they should mean in the Palestinian context and also how, how they should be used. The risks of seeking totalizing frameworks are real. Focusing on citizenship and equality risk leaving colonial and racial structures in place. Likewise, while frameworks such as indigeneity and apartheid can have emancipatory potential, they can also be constrained through liberal and racial framing. Um, and maybe here I'll just link to what Shireen was talking about. And one of the things we also see in kind of, and this is why I'm so excited about the work of Shireen and, and, and Mark, is that we don't talk enough about uh, racial regimes within uh, Palestinian society. And some of my work is on the Bedouin community. Uh, and it, it, they are a community that is racialized within the Palestinian context, but there's also a deep racial structure within uh, 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 the Bedouin community itself uh, that really also shapes important questions around land entitlement, who owns land and uh, uh, racial capitalism and legacies of slavery and so on and so forth. So when it comes to race and race analysis, we need to consider not only the possibilities 
it opens, but also its limits and the ways in which it could be used to un undercut radical intellectual and activist anti-colonial liberationist projects. And here understood in a really broad term of liberation as it will encompass gender, race, sexuality, disability, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Lana, for that, and, and to Shireen for your for your contribution so far. And uh, big thanks to to Nora for the the invite and the, the introductions. And uh, to be honest, so much of what I've learned in thinking about uh, these questions has come in various different ways from from all all four of you on this panel and your work. And so, if so, it is great to be here with you all from uh, across the ocean. So. Uh, to, to try and take up your the question that you gave me, Norda, which was uh, a quite specific one about the limitations of the recent apartheid reports in terms of their racial analysis and about the value of the um, uh, Palestinian intellectual tradition uh, in, in filling some of the gaps in, in that analysis. Um, I think uh, like as these various Israeli and international human rights organizations started issuing their reports, on Israeli apartheid over the last uh, year or two, it, it has been quite striking that, um, you know, this, this has been broadly welcomed, obviously, by Palestinians and Palestinian rights activists as a significant move, while also at the same time being flagged as quite a belated one, right? And, and so the line that was written or said many times was that uh, Palestinians have been saying this for decades, right? Which is uh, self-evident to anyone who's been listening, obviously, uh, but in some of the work that I've been doing uh, myself and some together with, with Nora jointly, it, it felt like it would be useful to, to trace this out. Um, uh, so who's been saying it? What, what exactly have they been saying? Uh, is it that they've been, is what they've been saying the same as, as Beth Salem or Human Rights Watch or whoever, or, or where did the differences emerge? And, and in particular, in, in what ways are Palestinian thinkers in, engaging with these questions over uh, the decades, given us a more fuller kind of historicized and contextualized understanding of, of, of Israeli apartheid and, and why is this uh, important? Uh, and so one uh, preface before I get into that uh, is just to say that obviously you know th these reports have have been produced by human rights organizations who are working with international law as their frame of reference and so it is important to say I think that that international law itself has played its own role in uh, dehistoricizing race in in how it, it deals with race or doesn't as the case might be in uh, and also in delinking apartheid from colonialism in, in quite specific ways and essentially in recasting apartheid as it was understood in, in Southern Africa as uh, colonialism of a special type in, in the analysis of the South African Communist Party, for example, into something more uh, like discrimination of a, of, a, of a special type, let's say, where racial discrimination racial discrimination itself in international law encompasses a, a, a kind of a broader idea of discrimination on, as being on the basis of, of nationality or, or ethnicity or descent or other categories and, and, and Lana's touched on that and I think it, it's part of the story of how we end up with some of the kind of references in the human rights watch or in the human rights uh, organizations reports about Israeli apartheid existing without racist ideology, for example, or without involving race at all. Uh, and so where, um, whereas by, by contrast, I think what the, what the anti-colonial and, and, and anti-racist strands of, of Palestinian intellectual traditions going back through the years helps us to understand is the centrality of, of race and racism to settler colonialism as a structure of, of colonization and conquest and racial sovereignty and racial borders and to apartheid as a particular manifestation and, and medium of settler, colonial, so settler colonialism in that light. And, and, and these material and analytic connections between uh, coloniality, race and apartheid are, are fundamental. Uh, okay, and so in terms of some of the uh, traditions and sites of, of Palestinian thought on all of this, um, you know, there's a vast wealth of, of literature and, and thinkers that I'm not going to be able to get anywhere near doing uh, 
justice too. But I'll, I'll just mention at least a few of the er, some of the early examples from from the 1960s and 70s, uh, in particular as as illustrative. Um, the, the founding of the PLO's Palestine Research Center in the 1960s is obviously crucial in the internationalization of the Palestinian struggle as an anti-racist uh, struggle, amongst other things. And uh, Faya Sayyid has been, been mentioned. Uh, it, the, the text on Zionist colonization in Palestine from 1945, from 1965 by Sayyid is, is key. Uh, and, and he makes explicit reference to um, apartheid and, and the Zionist practitioners of, of apartheid in, in Palestine in that text, he ties together the Nakba, the imposition of a military rule on Palestinian enclaves after 1948 as settler settler state uh, traits, and, and he insists on the centrality of, of racism and, and racial, racial ideology to the settler state, um, and uh, explaining that that is really apartheid and its, its enactment of racialized distinctions in law produces these three corollaries of racial segregation, racial exclusiveness, and racial uh, supremacy, which together are all predicated on the settler colonial logics, logics of displacement, subordination, and elimination of uh, natives. And so, um, th- you know, th- that, that's, a, that's, that's a fundamental um, contribution. And I, and I think it is important to remember as well that that, that, that Sayek's chapter where he kind of flesh theorizes and fleshes out these relationships between Zionism and racism and apartheid is you know that, that that's not written in, in isolation, but it's it's building on the two prior chapters on the historical dynamics and the evolution of, of Zionist colonization as foundational. And it demonstrates that apartheid itself doesn't emerge in a vacuum or as some kind of deviation from a prior democratic uh, norm. Um, there, there are plenty of um, further pub- publications from the, the Palestine Research Center, Hassan Saab, later that year. Uh, you mentioned already Nora made, made you know, similarly clear the, the juridically racial character of the, of the Israeli state, emphasized that, the, that uh, the state discriminates among the citizens on racial grounds, uh, that, that Israel has one law for Jewish citizens and another for, for Arab citizens and so on. And that, that kind of line of analysis continued in the work of the Palestine Research Center and its publications in tr- t- uh, t- to the 70s and, and, and into the also in, into the institutional in, uh, initiatives at the UN and other uh, in international organizations. Uh, and so but the, but you know the, one of the key points about this is that this predates the the 67 occupation, as does other work, uh, such as by, by Sabri Jiris on, on the, the Arabs in Israel, uh, which was published originally in Hebrew and Arabic in, in 1966. And, you know, these uh, pre-67 analysis um, uh, reinforce the point that that Israeli apartheid is, is not an accumulation of the, the worst excesses since 1967 or, or within the occupation. It, it predated that expansion. It was rooted uh, in 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 the outset uh, in the understanding the constitution of of the state itself and and uh, Elias Zurek mentioned as well uh, for framing Israel's internal colonialism within the forty eight ter- territory as a form of apartheid in which race relations converge with class dynamics uh, manifested in in segregation in housing land ownership education political organization labor distribution, marriage, and everything else, right? Uh, another um, important site of, of knowledge production in this period is, is the, the Journal of, of Palestine Studies, which, you know, from its own inception in the early 70s onwards was, was featuring fairly consistent references to, uh, to Israeli apartheid. So if you go through their archive, you find pieces through the 70s, for example, characterizing the, the kibbutz and the settlements as apartheid institutions, critiquing the uh, economic apartheid practiced by Zionist organizations, uh, and noting the, the, the South African parallels in, in Israel as a settler colony and so on. And, you, you know, you find work by, by Rashi Khalidi in there in the, in the 80s, talking about apartheid and Bantu stands. Um, Edward Said has been mentioned as well, you know, and, and if you go back through, I think, but by my count, seven uh, books and, and essay collections that Said published altogether on, on Palestine, all bar one of them, he's referring explicitly and, and repeatedly to 
um, to Israeli apartheid as, as a project of, of racial conquest, as a, a, a process of, of dispossession and, and displacement and, and colonial uh, de facto apartheid. And, 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 and he roots it in, in the underlying ideology um, from, uh, and, and, and I'm quoting here, from, from the wholesale dispossession of the non-Jews to the minute details of apartheid on the West Bank, all of it coming from the essentially racialist uh, difference between Jew and non-Jew. And so there's, you know, there's countless more examples. And I think, you know, it's also worth uh, highlighting, I think, in the more recent decades, particularly the analysis by Palestinian women scholars and, and feminists has been leading the way in, in many regards, and, and not least by, by those of you on this panel, um, and also by people like Leila Farsakh, who's been who's been writing for, for the last 20 years about uh, the historical colonialist foundation of apartheid, the Bantustani, Bantustanization of Palestine through the, the, the economic and labor dimensions, as well as the, the legal and territorial facets. Uh, Nadia Abu al Hajj has, has emphasized again the, the racial character of the, the state and its organization around distinctions between different categories of, of citizens and subjects, and so on. And so, you know, there, there's, there's so much more. Um, uh, we can cite, but but certainly I think some of the most uh, you know if we, if we think about the the, the um, commentary and the responses to to the various uh, apartheid reports over the last couple of years, some I think some of the most important and incisive commentary has come from uh, people like Lana and Nora yourselves and uh, Yara Hawari, Rania Muharab, Suhair Assad, and and others, where the common denominator really has been, and, and Lana has emphasised this, the, the the importance of the nexus between apartheid and settler colonialism, and and the need to situate race and racial dominate domination in that light. And so I think uh, Lana is. Uh, right to point out that we should be cautious of some of these uh, more liberal readings of, of Israeli apartheid, um, because with you know that that kind of liberal or universalist and and in some cases very criminal law oriented understandings of, of apartheid, we do lose um, fundamental elements of the the colonial and the material essence of it. We construct a version of apartheid that can potentially be remedied by, by formal equality uh, rights or, or non-discrimination status without necessarily having to, to, to confront the conquest and the land enclosure and the resource accumulation and other uh, uh, political economy dynamics that, that the apartheid regime has, has consolidated. And so the consequence of, of this is to, to um, de-link apartheid from settler colonialism and the Nakba and potentially allow for a vision of apartheid um, appearing to be dismantled, but without the, the necessary elements of decolonization, reparations or uh, redistribution, which is which is what the uh, critical scholars uh, working in South Africa today have, have labeled as, as neo-apartheid. And so, it, so I, do, I think it's, it's vital that anti-apartheid analysis and campaigning is, is conscious of this. And that's where I think, you know, there is value to beyond the, you know, just the politics of, of representation or citation, there is value to the Palestinians have been saying this for decades, refrain in its insistence on the importance of, of anti-colonial knowledge production and, and theorizing the struggle as it's being waged. And so if we say, okay, now we recognize that when Palestinian intellectuals and anti-imperialists and, and uh, lawyers even were saying 60 or 40 or 20 years ago that this is an apartheid system. Uh, if we acknowledge that they were right and we realize that now, the, you know, the crucial kind of logical lesson to take from that, um, and I'll finish on this point, is, is about the importance then of listening to what Palestinian scholars and social movements and youth activists and uh, workers going on general strike and so on are saying today about uh, racism, about some of the limits of apartheid analogies, about um, uh, settler colonialism and, and Zionism, and, and in most importantly, probably the, the demands of decolonization, as, as you put it earlier, Nora. Uh, and so the importance of, of uh, and the urgency of responding and, and acting on that now uh, rather than in another 20 or 40 or, or 60 years time. Uh, and so I'll finish there. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Hill. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, 
first of all, thank you, uh, Nora, for for inviting me. Uh, I, I have learned a great deal from our uh, conversations, uh, working together uh, on, on projects, and, and of course, those long uh, WhatsApp messages. All of it has uh, helped me think through these issues in, in increasingly complicated ways. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to sit here with uh, friends and colleagues, all of whom I've uh, learned from both through their writing and in person. Uh, and I'm very grateful to be sharing space with all of you right now. Um, this question of race, racism in Palestine for me is an interesting one. And Nora gave me a very specific prompt, uh, which was based on my uh, field work in Palestine, specifically in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem, uh, in the African quarter with, with the Afro-Palestinian community. And the question was um, sort of asking me to think through some of the challenges of, of, of this quote unquote search for sameness uh, and how I think about the significance of race and racism in the lives uh, of, of Palestinians. And, and, and I, it's, it's a question that I really appreciate. I'm gonna start uh, with a, uh, well, I'll start by saying, you know, I, I began this field work as, part, as, as an extension of a political project. I was, I was doing solidarity work after the Ferguson summer, after uh, Gaza summer in 2014. And I was very interested in, in some, of the, some of the conversations and some of the potential for renewals uh, of political solidarities and re-energizing of political solidarities. The, 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 there's never been a break, but, there's, but there have been moments of greater energy uh, in Black Palestinian solidarity, uh, particularly when we think of Black, not just in the United States context, but to think about some of the other solidarity projects that have happened from South Africa, some of the things we've seen in the global South, throughout the global South. It's a very complicated and interesting uh, conversation to be had and one day uh, I was with a delegation uh, and I was standing at uh, 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 Babel Amud uh, in, 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 old, uh, in the old city. And this guy comes up and he uh, speaks to me and he, he looked like anybody I would know where I was living in Brooklyn or where I was living in Philly at the time. And we started to talk and he told me that he was Palestinian and that he was an Afro-Palestinian. And uh, I had never encountered one before. And in all the sort of narratives of Palestine that I had heard, uh, blackness and, and, black, and black people, I'm using all these terms in quotes, which we'll unpack in a moment, um, really wasn't part of the conversation. So I was fascinated to talk to him and to find out that there was a community of Afro-Palestinians living in the old city of Jerusalem. They'd, they'd been there for a long time. Uh, this particular community had been there for well over a hundred years. They'd come from Senegal, from Chad, from Nigeria. Uh, they'd come in Sudan. Uh, some had come to join the Arab uh, Salvation Army uh, to fight uh, in, in, in the 48 war. Uh, they were there during the Nekba. Uh, some had gone on Hajj and they'd made Hajj, what they call Tijania Hajj routes. Uh, and they go and, and after leaving Mecca, they returned to uh, to um, to uh, to Masjid al Aqsa to sort of uh consecrate purify said hedge you know to kind of step up the the next level of, of, of religiosity uh and uh and they ended up staying uh some were the Senegalese men were hired to be security forces for Mesh al-Aqsa partly because these Senegalese men had uh, reputations for being strong and for being warriors or for having greater physical ability than some of the others again we, we, the, the, there's some of these I'll just have to leave a subtext because I only have like eight minutes but, um, but this all became part of the conversation that was there. Uh, 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 Haj Amin and Husseini uh, gave them these two buildings. Uh, the Jordanian Waqf uh, supported them. They were considered very religious people, but they were very much involved in the Palestinian struggle. And in fact, the person who I met, Ali Jeddah, uh, spent 17 years in, a, in, 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 in prison uh, after uh, participating in the resistance movements. Uh, uh, he was arrested in 1968. Uh, this is all part of the movement. Many people in the community were part of the PFLP. They were they were part of they were part of various movements, and they like mo many most Palestinians were incarcerated. They were detained. They were arrested, etc., for their participation in the struggle. And so they're very much bound up in Palestinian uh, life and Palestinian resistance to the point that right now I'm, I was on the phone with a few uh, sort of doing some follow up interviews this week, and and they're. Um, 
and and they've been involved in what the the, the AP calls clashes, but the rest of us would call a brutal colonial uh, form of violent domination of 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 Palestinian people during Ramadan in Masjid Al Aqsa. Um, so this is the backdrop of the field work. I've spent the last five years trying to understand how race comes to mean something to them. Uh, and, and I use the word how very particularly because when we think about the language of racialization and racial formation, it's not just what race means, it's how race comes to mean that. What are the processes? What are the institutional arrangements? What are the capital arrangements? What are all the things that, 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 that are constituted and, and that are intertangled that allow us to create this, this conception of race? And I've been increasingly uh, drawn to uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's language where she says race can be understood as the state sanctioned and or legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death. Um, and I have to give Nora a hat tip for that because she sort of nudged me in that area. Um, and the reason why that's important will become clear uh, as I talk, tell a quick story. Uh, uh, two summers ago, right before the pandemic actually, I, we were, I, I had Ali in the car and, and some other youth. We were coming from, from we were coming from somewhere. Uh, I won't say where. And, and we were coming and we, we were stopped by, uh, we were approaching uh, uh, Israeli soldiers who were stopping us. And, you know, like people, oppressed people anywhere when you see soldiers or police, you know, you start moving stuff around, you start hiding stuff, you start getting yourself, you, you, you're bracing yourself for a for the kind of ritual harassment that comes when you confront state power. And when I got closer, I saw that the soldiers who, the soldier who was waving us down his lane of this checkpoint was a, um, was, was, it, was an Ethiopian. And I said in the car, whoo, it's a black soldier. And Ali, I learned many new Arabic words in that moment, uh, many of which <laughs> explained explain to me all the reasons why I was being ridiculous and why this was actually potentially going to be an even more problematic interaction for them and for him. Um, and it was at that moment that I got a greater level of clarity about the dynamics, not just of race and racism and racialization, but specifically blackness and anti-blackness in Palestine. Um, these soldiers that are standing there, and again, I know I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do my best to do this quickly. Um, and th these soldiers are Israeli soldiers. They are black and they are, in the sense that they, that they are read as phenotypically different. They are, they are part of the Beta Israel community, many of whom who came in the 1980s through Operation Moses and later Operation Solomon. Uh, these are people who are airlifted and they become part of the extraordinary Israeli uh, Hasbara narrative that this is a racially neutral, colorblind, welcoming nation state that will take anybody in who is vulnerable as long as they meet the conditions of the nation. And so, and so they are often trotted out as examples. We have, we have, we have, we have these people in the Knesset. We have these people uh, ascending to high levels in the, in the Israeli military. These are extraordinary people. And what they leave out in that moment uh, these moments is the fact that it was an extraordinary struggle to get them here, that many who are called the Falashmoda are still left in Ethiopia, that many who come, they, they were sent to absorption centers while Russian immigrants at the exact same time were allowed to kind of go freely, while they were kind of sort of forced into, into basically ghettos in, in, in Tel Aviv, in, in, in South Tel Aviv, uh, that the rabbinate is the determining factor of immigration within the country. And the resistance to have more Ethiopians coming in was part of a broader narrative that the country was gonna be demogra demographically compromised if Ethiopians come into the country, right? And this is part of a broader conversation that, that Noda actually wrote about uh, in her article, Whiteness is Property in Israel, uh, which points out, and, and, and it, it, it comes in, in many forms, this conversation, that the Israeli state exercises forms of racialization and racism, not purely from Jewish citizen to non-Jewish citizen, but also within the internecine uh, ethnic and, and ethno and ethnic and ethno-religious uh, debates and conversations that we're having. In other words, to be what designated as, as Mizraim, to be designated as uh, what they often derogatorily call Falasha, or more appropriately, the Beta Israel, whether you're Ashkenazim, Ashkenazim, whether you're Sephardim, these distinctions matter equally. In, 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 in for very particular ways in terms of how Israel itself is constituted as a nation state that is attempting to perfect a particular conception of whiteness, right? That 
and that's something we have to talk about if we're going to understand even who these soldiers are. So as these soldiers are beholden to anti-Blackness and racism, at the very same time, they are purveyors of state power. And this is what Ailey was trying to explain to me when he says, well, wait a minute. I said, you don't feel better when you see that? He said, no. He said, these are my occupiers. He said, these people are occupying me and say, I, I have no, my solidarity is not with them because the primary thing, he didn't use this language, he hadn't read Ruth Wilson Gilmore yet. But what he did say was the thing, that effectively what he says, the thing that consigns me to premature death is not me being black in this context. The thing that, that, pre, that consigns me to premature death is being Palestinian. And to that extent, when we talk about racialization and we talk about racial formation, it is not enough to say, oh, there are black people in Palestine, which is what people say when I say I study Afro-Palestinians, they say, oh, so there, there's black people there and if they black, they must get it bad, they must get it worse. That, that's not untrue, right? There, there, are, there are particular anti-black discourses that exist, right? That, 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 that uh, community is, is often derogatorily known by Palestinians as, as Hebe Salabi, right? As a, sl a slave prison, right? It, it, these, there, there is racism that exists when it comes to marriage, when it comes to beauty standards. I, I, I'm t I talk to students all the uh, students, I talk to kids all the time in the community who are straightening their hair or, or women who are doing skin bleaching. I mean, we see those things, but the thing that consigns them primarily to premature death is their racialization as Palestinians. And so we have to talk about that. But what I, what I would warn us against as we study race and racial formation in the Middle East in particular, is that we not stretch the term race and racialization so broadly that it just becomes another code word for ethnicity, that it just becomes another code word for caste, that it becomes just another uh, almost floating signifier of difference, which then does not allow us to keep track of anti-Blackness. Because even as I'm talking to Palestinians who are saying, yeah, we curse at the, 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 we curse at the Ethiopian soldiers just as much as we curse at the other soldiers. They, uh, people have repeatedly told me, but sometimes I have to stop my friends and say, why are you, why are you throwing racial slurs at the Ethiopian occupier, right? You're just calling him an ass, right? You're just you're just calling him, you know, some relation, some some derogatory term in relation to his mother. But this one you're calling a monkey. This one you're calling an animal. This one you're this one you're talking about his blackness. So even in the context of resisting a common occupier, we can see conversations about racism and anti-blackness, which can't be reduced to simply dip to, to this form of difference. So I think there's some value in framing. Uh, the Palestinian struggle and the resistance to, to Israeli occupation as an anti-racist movement. It allows us to form those connections. It allows for transnational solidarities like the ones that we're talking about. But we also have to talk about the way that this particular con con conversation at once can allow us to push back against it. And, and Shireen gets at this, right, in, in, in the history she was talking about. How it at once allows us to push back against imperial power. It allows us to resist uh, 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 the, the, these occupying forces of the West, but at the same time allow us to reinscribe whiteness or buy into a particular conception of whiteness as property that allows us to feel better because we're not Sudanese, that allows us to feel better because we're not from Ayn Diyuk, or we're not from Tul Kerem, or we're not from Wadi al Hawadith, or we're not from these other places where people look dark, where we're, where we're, we're not from the Bedouin village, right? Where, where we say, oh, we're all, we're all Muslim and Islam kills racism, but I still don't want you to marry. Right. Where we say, oh, everybody's a, a, a Jew here in the Jewish state. And so we're all welcome. But those Ethiopians, they, they're not Jewish, Jew, Jewish because they don't practice rabbinical Judaism, even though their form of temple worship precedes the, the rabbinical Judaism that 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 um, that they're using as a standard bearer of, of, of global Jewry. In fact, the Ethiopians were like, yo, we came here. We didn't even know we were shocked because we didn't know they were they, we didn't know they were white Jews. Right. To them, to the Ethiopians, their form of their form of practice was more ancient, but somehow it wasn't considered acceptable within this context. And we have to ask the question of why. So all of this can't be, can, cannot be sort of washed away in a conversation about racialization, but we need that conversation. We need to talk about what's happening to the Badoon in, 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 in Kuwait or, or in other Gulf countries. We need to talk about what's happening to workers in Lebanon. We need to talk about what's happening in Mauritania, Morocco, around conversations around slavery. We need to talk about these enduring legacies, but we don't want to lose track of anti-Blackness because like I experienced at that checkpoint, the conversations are complex and there are political stakes attached this is the last thing I'll say, because when I came back to the States, an Ethiopian citizen had just been killed by the police. Ironically, this particular person they thought was Palestinian, which is why the police shot him. And they, they moved the gun closer to him and said that he uh, was attacking them. I moved the knife closer to them and said that, the, that he was attacking the police. I mean, anybody in the States that knows this story. And they were asking for Black Lives Matter. They were, they, were, they were talking about how they could have a Black Lives Matter movement in Israel. 
which produces another interesting and complicated conversation, right? What does it mean to have a Black Lives Matter movement for Ethiopians who are who are at, who are both victims of, of anti-blackness and white supremacy, but at the same time are part of a, a settler colonial project when the BLM movement at its uh, and the movement for Black Lives more broadly was an anti-imperialist movement. So how do we work through these contradictions? How do we how do we talk about blackness and anti-black violence? How can we think through these frameworks? How can we nurture new frameworks that keep track of our humanity that allow us to move forward toward justice, um, but don't let us off the hook either? So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, all of you, um, for your contributions. Uh, I know we've run a bit over time, but I suggest that we take 10, 15 minutes, if you don't mind. So um, we'll take, uh, I would say, three questions. Um, so please go ahead if you have any question or comment. Hey. <laughs> I can ask a question. Yeah, I was going to ask a question as well, but why don't you go ahead oh, first? No, go ahead, Nadia, please. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you've addressed it, I guess, all in, in different ways, but I would like you to maybe more directly address the question of, so what are the, I guess, the opportunities, the possibilities for not just a transnational political solidarity, but a knowledge production where we don't just take... Um, you know, knowledge that and theories that are being produced mainly in North America or Europe and then sort of try to apply them to the Middle East, more specifically Palestine, and in this context, you know, racialization and racism. So what are the opportunities that you see in the context of Palestine, but what are also the limi limitations? Where doesn't it work so well and where, um, I mean, I sometimes also get worried that in the in the way that Palestine is being discussed in the US, sometimes where people who do not, and none of you of course, <laughs> but you know, more generally people who do not, uh, are not very knowledgeable about Palestine, but use it as a kind of just a symbolic marker mm -hmm. of, um, you know, a certain kind of progressiveness and anti-regime status. But to me that gets quite, problematic as well, and I was just wondering if you could sort of address that, um, any of you. But um, let's see if there are other questions. Yes, Yanis. Yes, thank you also. Uh, just a second. Thank you for the amazing uh, papers. I just wanted to ask a question about the definition of the Afro-Palestinian today, and I was wondering whether that category includes not only the you know, black people who came into Palestine, let's say, historically during the Ottoman Empire or during the Mandate period, but also recent immigrants, black immigrants into the area. Does that category include all those? And if so, what are the connections between the different sub subgroups? Thank you very much, Yanis. I'm now going to take a question from our uh, webinar audience, our colleague, Srimati Mitter. Hello, Srimati. Uh, thank you all for your thought-provoking comments. My question is about the labor aspects of race, particularly domestic South Asian workers, mainly Sri Lankan Tamil in Palestine, living currently in the occupied West Bank, who are more or less enslaved because they don't have Israeli permits or papers and cannot leave. They work for wealthy Palestinian families. Why are they so absent, invisible from all other forms of political organizing and solidarity in Palestine? Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll take one more question and then we have to close. So maybe each of our panelists can take a question since mm. it looks like there's four. Um, so I was thinking about the point that Professor Ali raised about um, uh, how Naeem was kind of towing the line of whiteness and um, the identity provided by the colonial state to act as a, as a colonial officer and in thinking about that, because that brought up the question of how um, even within, oh, well, could, could, could I be heard before? Yeah, I think okay. so, yeah. Yes, yeah. So I was wondering how in the context of um, nation state and international law, how that is very similar, that in, in, the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, the PLO 
in a sense was not seen as a legitimate organization and then over time that became more accepted in international law because they started towing the line of statehood. And so I be, I'm thinking about how this, this category of a broader, more hegemonic power which is acceptable in, in thinking, how that is always uh, you know, engulfs how resistance and people resisting that category also has to, s in some, some ways, you know, make themselves palatable in order to participate in that larger category. So I'm thinking about how that has continued in the question of Palestine and how that continues um, into the future and how we can ever step out of that narrative of hegemony and subalternism in thinking about Palestine. Thank you. Can I suggest how they take the okay. So, um, Shirin, would you like to answer that question? Mark, if you can answer Jens's question on Afro-Palestinians. Um, I don't know, John, since you're um, our Dubliner, if you want to tell us a little about uh, grafting U.S. frameworks, racial frameworks, onto the rest of the world. And Lana, if you want to take a stab at the domestic workers. Okay, thank you. So, Shireen, would you like to start? Okay, okay. And I will do my best not to take up too much time this time. Um, thank you so much for that question about international law, which I think is better answered by Nura um, on particularly uh, the United Nations, the PLO, their place within um, international law and international recognition. But I want to say a couple of points inspired by your question. One, I, yes, Naeem is, uh, has access to whiteness because of British colonial power, but he is not only experiencing it because of that British colonization, of that British categorization. That's part of what I'm trying to get at. So for a lot of these people like Naeem, their year zero is 1860, the kind of, um, you know, sectarian confessional um, 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 struggle in Mount Lebanon, right? And a lot of these Syrian Christians are understanding the future as kind of providing some type of uh, a, a, a new kind of rule that is different from Ottoman Muslim rule, right? So I'm really trying to map out here that some of these figures um, that I'm studying, Naeem and people who are in Sudan at this time, are looking to the British and French and thinking, oh, maybe these guys are going to be better than the Muslims because the Muslims haven't been that great to us. They get to Sudan and they're like, oh, yeah, we're just like these guys, right? And we're, they're going to let us in. And then they don't let them go to their parties. They don't let them take their spouses to the dinners and, and clubs. And then they're like, wait, we're not like these guys. We're more like these people, although we're better than these people. So I guess what I wanna suggest is the way to escape the hegemony is also to not understand Europe and the Europeans and the colonial process as the only source of our troubles. <laughs> And this links to, I think, Nadia asked this question. I, I would say, Nadia, number one, I totally agree with you. Palestine, for everybody that is out there doing this amazing work, is not just a case study. And the kind of work that John is doing, the kind of work that Mark is doing, Lana, Nora, everybody here, is work that we must engage, read, and understand in order to think about and with Palestine and Palestinians, not just about us from a distance, right? But here I would also say, I would caution because sometimes when we bring in the categories of race, people will say, oh, you're just bringing in like imperial frameworks. People have literally said that to me. Like, this is not, this is not, you know, which isn't what you're saying, Nadia, but I'm gonna take this opportunity to just, you know, come in on that point, because it's not an imperial framework. Ibn Khaldun was writing, Jahiz was writing about blackness, right? So, so we can, I think, uh, uh, I think we have to step away from understanding race as located in a particular place 
and think about the ways that it travels across time and space. At the same time that I really agree with Mark, we can't flatten race in the way, you know, we have to take seriously uh, all of these differentiations uh, across settler colonial and colonial projects. Thank you. Lana? Yes. Um... It's going to be quick. I don't have much uh, um, um, information and I haven't studied the question of labor uh, in this particular context. But what I can say is that we do have serious issues uh, 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 within Palestinian society of con contending and addressing uh, issues of labor exploitation, racialized forms uh, uh, of labor, and so on and so forth. And we see those things manifesting in different ways through uh, um, um, also through interrelate interracial relations within the Palestinian society. And yes, these are not issues we're dealing with well. Uh, uh, we're better at articulating our, our, the forms of racialization we encounter within the context of Zionism and the Israeli state. And we have a lot of work that we need to do uh, in relation to what Shirin uh, uh, is working on, Mark, uh, and your question as well. So I'm not surprised that they are also being excluded from this kind of political organizing and also from the scope of scholarship and what we are looking at. I think this is the challenge of when we're talking about uh, uh, integrating race analysis into, um, uh, into Palestine studies, how do we expand the scope and how do we address these issues and how we position them again within the particular context of Palestine, but we are also part of the Middle East and these kind of forms of labor exploitation uh, uh, really also uh, uh, speak to what is happening in Lebanon and the Gulf uh, and other, uh, other places as well. So we do have a lot of work to be done uh, uh, on this front, uh, both in terms intellectually and both in terms of political organizing and political work on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alana. John? Oh. I can, I can, can, do you mind if I go with that? Yeah, I, yeah, I may go have ahead. Yes, sure, Mark. Uh, Mark, yeah. Um, the, the question about the Af Af Afro-Palestinian co community is a really interesting one. Um, the term Afro-Palestinian is a term almost exclusively used by people in Jerusalem in the African quarter. They identify as African, uh, Afro-Palestinian or African-Palestinian, if, if, if they follow Stini. And so they, they, they do so because they're very much connected to their homelands. They know exactly where they're from. They know who their parents are. They can go two generations, three generations back and tell you exactly what home looks like, who their parents were, what tribes they were from in Nigeria and in Senegal, mostly Nigeria and, and, and Chad. Um, they still eat some of the, some, some dishes from home where they mix uh, sort of traditional Palestinian dishes with dishes from home. They're, they're dancing dub kid, but they're, they're mixing it with African drummer, particular types of African drumming. They're very committed to this kind of African identity, though over time, generation by generation, it, it changes because there's, there's a lot of intermixing. And this is one of the things that the older uh, generations talk about. They're now four to five generations in, depending on how you think about generations. Um, but if we're talking about the African presence in Palestine, now we have a much broader conversation. Um, there are people who came in the Uthmani army. There are people who came uh, as a part of Bedouin slave trade. Um, there are people who came voluntarily again on Hajj. There are people who came uh, to, to, to fight in solidarity as Muslims with, against, against the, um, in, in 1948. Uh, there are also Americans who, who emigrated from the States to here. If you think about the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem, for example, or the Hebrew Israelites who left Chicago, went to Liberia and ultimately landed uh, in, in, in the Nakab. Uh, they call themselves African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem, but they're in Demona. Um, and they are, um, they are there, uh, they identify as Hebrew. They do not identify as Jewish per se. 
uh, they have been there. They came under the idea of the of the law of return. Uh, they their narrative is that a few that within eight months of them, them arriving, uh, the law of return was rewritten in such a way that they were no longer included. Uh, of course, the law of return in general was it was was designed not to exclude Afro uh, Afro Palestinians or Afro Hebrews, but to exclude Palestinians from returning home. And so all of this becomes part of of, of the mix. And then of course there are asylum seekers, people from Eritrea uh, and Sudan who went to uh, Holot. Uh, uh, camp, which is now closed, uh, and they were held there, and the Israeli government attempted to effectively put them in the equivalent of a prison so that they would either want to leave, want to leave or ultimately be pushed out. They were, uh, the money was offered for them to go to other African nations. Uh, this was another demographic crisis by the nation. And so all of these people are, are of African descent, but some of these people would not identify as such. When you talk to uh, someone in, in Jericho or in Diouf, uh, and you say, uh, where are you from? Or if you say someone's from Jericho, where are you from? They may say, I'm the They're not going to say I'm from, you know, five generations ago, I'm from Nigeria. You know, if you talk to someone from Tulukadam, they're going to say, I'm from Wadi al before 48. I'm not, they're, they're not going to go, you know, far, far back. And so, and that's for a variety of reasons. Part of it is the mixing of, of mixing and marriage. Some of it is about sort of stigma around, around and shame around slavery and caste. Some of it is, or, I mean, there are a variety of reasons why people don't do this, but all of this represents the kind of African presence in, uh, in, the, in, in, in the region. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, John, but very quickly, please, because we, uh, yes. It's almost 1 a.m. <laughs> <now, laughs> yes. So big up to you. Yes, man. yes, uh, I'm very impressed with uh, yeah, okay, thanks, Nigel, for the question. And, and so I think, um, you know, as I understand it, you know, I think it, it is really about the importance of, of knowledge production uh, in struggle and as part of struggle. Um, and so, um, you know, if we think about that knowledge production specifically in, in terms of race, you know, I, I do agree with what, with what Mark said about, you know, that we do need to be um, cautious about about race being used as this kind of placeholder for for everything and anything else. Um, at the same time, it is obviously a construct, and it is something that has been constructed and imposed from above. Um, you know, primarily in in some kind of form of imperial context, and so, but it's it, but it's also been um, in 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 that context re shaped or twisted or turned back uh, by anti-imperial movements and by struggles uh, from uh, below in terms of how they articulate an anti-racist or anti-imperial struggle. And so if we think even about Cedric Robinson and, and racial capitalism, right, where, does, where did that idea germinate from, right? It was from the um, interactions and conversations and, and organizing that, that Cedric Robinson was involved in with uh, Black South Africans in, in exile and and the the way that they were kind of trying to uh, think through and theorize what was happening in, in south africa at that time and so <clears throat> it was originally uh coined as as apartheid capitalism in, in some of the earlier work on that and so and and you know i think the the point uh that you made at the start nor about you know racial capitalism and and the, the um analysis you know going all the way back to earlier uh, pre-imperial forms of of um of uh racialization as you know as we understand it now you know that that is important if we you know if we think about what you know where are the sites of knowledge production today in thinking about questions of of uh, race and liberation and so on in palestine right as much as it is the you know the essential work that that scholars and uh, intellectuals are doing it's also the Gaza Youth Movement and the Manifesto of Dignity and Hope and, and these kind of uh, documents that are, you know, uh, not, um, uh, not, not, not simply absorbing categories that are being uh, dictated or, or handed down from, from elsewhere, but are using, you know, framing things in their own language and, and uh, combining uh, thinking and ideas and knowledge in a way that makes most sense for articulating their claim, uh, you know, in the crucible of struggle in the, in the moment. And so, you know, even, if, and so there's, you know, various kind of analogies or, or parallels, uh, you know, we can think about in in that but just maybe very quickly to, to finish on this like if we think about specifically the, the the human rights organizations and the apartheid reporter and we think about the dominant kind of international human rights law and international criminal law language and how particular 
analysis are very uh, uh, faithful to that in going through in quite you know fine detail and meticulously the the elements of of um, of apartheid and so on. Right, if we think about what um, you know the, the fact that and I didn't get to, to, to speak about this um, uh, in my intervention, but but another form of the, the Palestinian tradition are the Palestinian legal organizations and human rights organizations that that have also been doing their version of. Uh, and analyzing Israeli apartheid, you know, long before Human Rights Watch or Beth Salem or whoever, and, and going back to the 1990s, but but in a way that it, that isn't so um, uh, necessarily deferential to what it, to, to how international law defines things, and has also you know been quite uh, wary and and um, uh, consistent in also linking apartheid to colonialism and and and. Um, uh, refusing in some ways this this narrowing of, of apartheid into a, a human rights discourse and so you know it, and a lot of that work revolved around the Durban conference in 2001 and the work that this Palestinian civil society organizations were doing at that time and starting to flesh out their um analysis of of Israeli apartheid in 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 quite elaborate uh, and detailed terms and the at that time you know there was a big confrontation in the in the civil society forums between the Palestinian and global south and third world organizations and what they wanted to do with the language of the documents and the likes of human rights watch who at the time were saying it's absolutely wrong to be equating Zionism or Israel with with racism or, or apartheid and we, we don't want to um uh, go anywhere near that and so that you know we do as, as much as it's important that that human rights watch has uh come to the position it has now you know we can't uh, ignore or, or forget that genealogy and and uh, the important and, and, and we can't uh, overstate the importance of you know the work that's gone in over the last 20 years from those Palestinian rights activists and lawyers and from the students organizing the Israeli apartheid weeks and so on and who were the ones being disciplined and punished uh, and uh, for doing so and not defended by the big prestigious uh, human rights organizations at the time and so you know I think that it that is important to to uh, highlight as well great well thank you all so very much <laughs>